seminar. Um, <clears throat> the first speaker is Jim Thompson, who was raised on the coast of Maine and worked in the sailing industry prior to beginning a career in physical oceanography. After completing his PhD at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology uh, joint program at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, he joined the University of Washington's Applied Physics Lab in 2006. Dr. Thompson also has a joint appointment in the UW's Faculty of Civil Engineering, Civil and Environmental Engineering. He studies waves and currents in the coastal ocean with an emphasis on field measurements and physical processes. As a member of the Northwest National Marine Renewables Energy Center, Dr. Thompson is developing techniques to select and monitor sites for tidal energy development. And he's actually going to spend just a few minutes talking about that, which I think is a great idea. Uh, <coughs> Christopher Krems, uh, for those of you in our EAT program are quite familiar with Christopher, he received his PhD in 1999 from the Christian Albrecht University, Zul Kiel. How's my German? <laughs> he, it passes. He, uh, <laughs> that's good enough. He pursued his academic career as a biological oceanographer at several universities and Germany, in Germany and the U.S., and has published in the field of marine microbial <laughs> ecology and sea ice research. From 2002 to 2008, Christopher held a position at the Applied Physics Lab, UW, where he published on microbial processes and interactions of marine biofilms and habitat structure in high latitudes. Since 2008, Christopher has been the lead oceanographer in EAPS Marine Monitoring Unit. Interesting fact about Dr. Thompson, his first rock concert was Screaming Trees. Now, who's heard of Screaming Trees? I knew Gary would, and all the youngsters in the audience. 1990 in Portland, Maine. Christopher has yet to go to his first rock concert. This is embarrassing. <laughs> So if there are any volunteers to drag him to a rock concert, I'm sure he would appreciate that. So without further ado, their topic, as you can see, is about waves. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for coming this morning. Um, I'm not Jim Thompson, but you know, I think you made that transfer. Um, so I would like to talk uh, <clears throat> or present the first part of our presentation, Atmosphere Reach as a conduit follow ox oxygen water uh, intrusions into Puget Sound. And so what I would like to do is draw first the big picture, why our unit, the Marine uh, Long-Term uh, Monitoring Unit, is interested uh, in that site. And then uh, Jim will follow on uh, being much more uh, specific about the physical aspects and the larger collaboration of uh, that project. So um, <clears throat> let me first step back. We have in our uh, marine monitoring uh, unit for the water column nine people, and I would like to thank uh, each one of them uh, for their great contributions for all the hard work and the data that I will be uh, presenting here. Okay, so the question is, what are we doing? Um, and <clears throat> I would first like um, sort of to remind everybody that um, we sort of we look at a section of uh, water quality, which sort of deals with long-term trends in eutrophication and uh, dissolved oxygen as a stress indicator. And since 1973, we have a network of ambient monitoring stations in the Salish Sea, but also along the coast. And I would like to point out these three uh, new marine reference stations that are important for us that we also entertain. We visit uh, these stations uh, with a, a seaplane, float plane, uh, because it's a very cost-effective way uh, to get um, to all these stations. And we have a CTD package that we lower uh, through the hull of uh, the plane into the water. And so we can take continuous data in the water column with in situ sensors, but we also have uh, NISCAN bottles and can collect discrete samples. Uh, as of late, we sort of uh, added on route ferry data because of Brandon's great um, 
sort of resourcefulness, and we also have fixed modes and satellite imagery to complement uh, our efforts. So we collect a, a suite of uh, water quality indicators that also help us to understand estuarine processes uh, in Puget Sound. Okay, I first would like to uh, step back and place everything into a context uh, geographically and also in time. Puget Sound is connected uh, to the North Pacific through the Strait of Juan de Fuca. This is a satellite image that shows that uh, we have upwelling along the coast, which brings nutrient-rich, uh, low-oxygen water, uh, at times very near to the surface. <coughs> and uh, there's a lot of variability in the North Pacific that has the potential to affect also water quality in Puget Sound. Two uh, nice indices uh, that are available describes of the variability of the coast of Washington. One is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which looks at sea surface temperatures, uh, temperature anomalies uh, in red. And the other one is the uh, Coastal Upwelling Index by the Pacific Fisheries Environmental Laboratory. Both indices report anomalies. Down here I have uh, plotted 70 years of uh, anomaly data of these two indices red uh, the PDO and uh, blue being the upwelling. And you see that most of the time uh, these indices are sort of uh, exclusive of one another. So in other words, if sea surface temperature is warmer, normally upwelling is, is weaker. But uh, you also have times when they begin to be in phase. And I would like to draw your attention on that period from 1999 to present, where it seems that sea surface <coughs> temperature was uh, warmer and upwelling was stronger up to 2008, where upwelling uh, took a sharp uh, dip. So keep that transition point in mind. So that's the temporal and geographical context. Uh, we have um, a lot of variables, and in order to show basically the anomalies of these variables in the same uh, context as these indices, uh, we subtract a time average seasonal cycle uh, from our data, and we're left with uh, anomalies just schematically indicated here. So everything that is higher than expected is red, lower is green, uh, expected values are black. And if you flip that on the head, like here you can generate a heat map which allows us to uh, <clears throat> provide a lot of information in a, in a uh, short figure. So colors indicate anomalies, black expected values, gray uh, sampling times when we couldn't uh, be in the field and each box is a monthly sampling event. So we sample monthly, and to just show you data from 1999 to 2010, uh, for the thermal energy content in the upper layer, zero to 50 meters, I plotted all the data for all the stations in Puget Sound, each line, <clears throat> and all the sampling events, and you see subjectively already a shift from green to red, here in the middle of the last decade, to green again, and then it picks up. <coughs> And when you compare that uh, to the sea surface temperature anomaly, you see that Puget Sound looks like uh, responding to large scale sort of climate uh, drivers. And <clears throat> if you basically take a large scale uh, approach and average an entire year for all stations for Puget Sound, as I've done here for each box, then you find a nice correlation uh, between the sea surface temperature variability and the energy content uh, in the upper water column. So that means that you cannot look at water quality in Puget Sound in isolation of large-scale oceanic processes and climate. Um, we're uh, interested in dissolved oxygen as a stress indicator. <coughs> um, but for us, sort of, uh, from a practical perspective, it's easier to look at the uh, oxygen deficit. And uh, what do I mean by that? This is a schematic drawing. So we have uh, a vertical profile of oxygen concentrations in water. Uh, based on pressure, salinity, and temperature, we can calculate a hypothetical 100% saturation line. And we're interested, basically, in that area that is undersaturated. And we integrate that up and look at the anomalies. And that approach uh, turned out to be very robust to mixing and uh, noise in the data set. <coughs> And to show you these anomalies in the uh, oxygen deficit, uh, again, so sort of plotted the heat map, uh, the lower part, and you see a shift from green uh, to red, and then sort of it begins to weaken again in 2010. So we look here at a depth interval from 20 to 50 meters, 
because we want to be away from the euphotic zone where we have uh, primary productivity interfering with our oxygen um, signal. So if you look at that pattern and look at the upwelling index, here at the upper one over time, you see that sort of the patterns seem to match. Again, if we take sort of a large scale approach and add uh, all the stations for an entire year here in triangles, you see that the DO deficit increased up to 2006 and then began to erode away. And I plotted uh, deeper uh, water strata as well, anything deeper than 50 meters to the bottom in small dots to show you that the trend also is valid for uh, deeper water layers, even though we don't have a complete data set. Okay, so when you look at the variability in um, uh, the oxygen deficit, then you see also a significant correlation with the upwelling index. So that begs the big question, well, is the ocean the only driver of the DO deficit? <clears throat> it's only a correlation, so it doesn't prove causality, but it sort of lends itself to it. But there's also significant noise in that correlation, so it's barely significant. <coughs> And I would like to show you that there are other processes occurring uh, in the larger Puget Sound region. Um, the trends in nitrogen are similar, so sort of they increase over time, uh, sort of a shift in green to red again. And when you do that sort of Puget Sound-wise, you see a significant increase over time, which is three micromole per 10 years. So that seems to be a small number, but keep in mind that's what's left over after the organisms have taken what they actually need. So the uh, actual increase in nitrogen could be much higher. If you look at phosphate, you see, again, significant increase over time. Now the increase is an order of magnitude smaller, <clears throat> which demonstrates also how sensitive our approach is. OK, so what indication do we have that the nutrients are potentially uh, not coming from the ocean? The silicate to dissolved inorganic nitrogen ratio in the oceanic environment is uh, considered fairly constant. And uh, <clears throat> when you have shifts in that ratio, that means that you likely have sources that, uh, nitrogen sources that are other than from an oceanic source. And when we plot again our data in Puget Sound, we see a significant decline um, over uh, the 12-year period, which is about 10 units. So that's quite large. And if we assume that silicate has stayed constant, then um, that reduction is significant. So, that could be a human factor, but it could be anything in the watersheds that is non-oceanic. So we don't have a, a clear indication of what it is. Um, what other tools do we have to take potentially the oceanic signal out? Uh, I mentioned the uh, GEMS station in the Strait of Juan de Fuca, the pink ones in the beginning. Um, at these stations, we also have nutrient and salinity data, and we can take salt as a passive tracer. So we can basically subtract the oceanic signal, nutrient signal, from the measurements in Puget Sound using a simple dilution line. So that's the formula for that. And basically anything that falls outside of that dilution line is an enrichment, either positive or negative. And so if we take that ocean signal out, we still see a significant increase in nitrate and a significant increase in phosphate over time, which is a second line of indication that these nutrients are not from an oceanic source. Okay, so how do we now fit the nutrients, or the increased nutrients together with the DO deficit? Uh, in oceanography, and I think also in limnology, um, <coughs> there's a clear understanding if you have a euphotic layer, it's stratified, you bring in nutrients, um, then you can sort of promote productivity, and that algae biomass can <coughs> either uh, be recycled in the upper layer, so you have uh, uh, recycled production or regenerated production and so in that case no organic material would make it uh, to deeper water or you can have enough nutrients that get uh, into the euphotic zone that give rise to a lot of uh, biological uh, biomass that then can be exported uh, to deeper uh, water layers and so that production is called export production and so when you export organic material, uh, ultimately you break it down a depth by bacteria that consumes oxygen, and that's how you link basically an increased level of nutrients at the surface with a drawdown of oxygen locally. So that's sort of the concept. Um, what indication or what sort of tools do we have to sort of get at the component of water that gets mixed into the upper layer that could be exported to depth? Um, the nitrogen ratio, so nitrate to total dissolved, in, uh, dissolved inorganic nitrogen, 
is sort of a nice ratio that says something about the quality of the nitrogen source. And in oceanographic terms, if you have more nitrate, you talk about deeper water that has been regenerated for a long time. Nitrogen is much stronger than, than any of uh, the other components of the nitrogen uh, budget. And so if you correlate that, um, <clears throat> sort of the nitrogen quality with uh, the DO deficit, for the Puget Sound region, you see a correlation. So what could that mean? So that, in a way, could be just indicative that you have upwelling and mixing being an important contribution to export production and drawdown of oxygen. Okay, so I would like to summarize basically the three pillars that make the whole process or the whole tracking of the O and future are complicated. Well, first of all, the ocean has a big influence. We saw that in the correlations, uh, but we don't know exactly how, uh, how big that is. So the DO deficit in Puget Sound cannot be understood in isolation of large-scale processes. And despite uh, a sizable influence on the DO deficit, macronutrients in Puget Sound continue to increase. So that could be eutrophication, but could, could be something else as well. And then upwelling and mixing seems to play an important role too, in that the DO deficit responds to qualitative change in the nitrogen sources. So, Consider all of these processes interacting. Now it's very complicated to tease out the human component uh, in that scenario. And therefore, <clears throat> EEP uh, is following strongly the approach to use modeling as a quantitative solution to evaluate the impact of human contributions to the DO deficit. So I think we cannot do without modeling. So what is the challenge for uh, modelers? Well, first of all, the environment is extremely variable, as schematically in this, uh, indicated here. And the human component might be quite small at times, so it's sort of an issue of signal-to-noise ratio. So that's very challenging. Then historically, we've been tracking uh, shifting baselines, so we have discrete samples in time monthly that don't necessarily have the temporal resolution to catch processes in Puget Sound that might affect water quality that modelers need to understand. Um, and at the same time, we sort of have a very sort of localized sampling grid. And so we're sort of constrained by the spatial variability at that very site. However, <coughs> modeling, because of their grid size, their interest, grid size, they're interested in a much larger footprint. So we have that spatial gap as well. So you wonder how that relates to Admiralty Reach, but that's now the jump where I get to Admiralty Reach. <laughs> Okay, so, um, so how could Admiralty Reach uh, and the moorings at this location be a strategic support for water quality models? When, there are basically five points that I would like uh, to mention. First of all, it's, it's a very central location of water renewal, so all the water that gets into Puget Sound has to pass through that location. If we have a mooring there, we have a very high temporal resolution to really sort of look at processes and events that sort of uh, <clears throat> uh, occurring at Admiralty Reach, and that helps us also understand how large-scale drivers sort of translate through an exchange of water at Admiralty Reach and ultimately uh, into Puget Sound. And um, since Admiralty Reach has very strong tidal flows, is it like <coughs> seven knots or six knots? Eight, Eight knots, yeah. Um, so that's a lot, sort of a lot of volume as well. I think sort of I did a bad envelope calculation. So the volume flux is uh, about five times as big as the Columbia River during maximal flow. So that's a lot of volume that goes in. And if you think about low DO and nutrients, that has to be sort of scaled uh, in the models correctly. So we know the tidal dynamics, so we can understand the water that goes in and out and can look at basically the direction of transport over time. And the strength is, you know, in order to scale it up to a footprint of a, or the grid size of a model, normally you need to shift, you know, sort of to run a transect. Here we have a mooring at one location, but the tide goes by. So we don't actually need to move the mooring, but the water does it for us in the tide. So it's very powerful. So we can scale it up to the scale that is relevant uh, for modelers. Um, uh, last and least, um, the very important point is, because of tides, we also know now the direction of transport. So that can really help us uh, to um, understand the processes out there. So schematically, um, we have Puget Sound, very simplified. 
uh, Admiralty Reach, a sill 65 meters and the Narrows. Um, we have at the surface uh, nutrient addition through land use practices, uh, sewage treatment plants, increased urbanization, stormwater runoff, and all the factors that affect basic productivity. We have vertical particle flux that connects the organic material and the nutrients to a potential uh, oxygen drawdown at depth. But the big gorilla in the equation is uh, the ocean. And so we have oceanic water that gets upwelled high enough into the water column to bring potentially a high saline, low oxygen signal over the sill that can spill into the basins. And we want to know basically when this occurs, how much it is attenuated, and how far it propagates within Puget Sound, and what the conditions are that drive it. Um, the marine monitoring unit for the water column has a spatially nested approach. Uh, we added satellite imagery, imagery uh, through Brandon and the Victoria Clipper. So we get at a larger surface footprint. We now have uh, aerial photography and sort of our historical um, uh, long-term monitoring program using the plane in mid-basin uh, locations. Now we sort of added moorings in these central strategic locations to get at the interbasin transport of salt, heat, and oxygen. And we collaborate uh, with other entities you dub uh, in this effort. OK, and just to show you uh, that the ocean is truly a gorilla in this equation, I um, took data from the National Oceanographic Data Center that Brandon gave me and <clears throat> wanted to indicate, basically, the red line is the nitrate concentration, the highest one we measure in Puget Sound on our uh, sort of uh, stations. And uh, this is salinity. And you see that, basically, at higher salinities, the nitrate concentration really increases drastically. So if that water makes it into Puget Sound, that's significant. And if you look at oxygen, similar thing, four micrograms is about uh, the concentration of oxygen that we see at Admiralty Reach. But all that area here at higher salinities of that water uh, off the coast here is at a lo much lower oxygen concentration. So if that water makes it in, it has a significant impact. Okay. Um, Admiralty Reach is located in a very dynamic environment and we do not have the expertise at ectology to maintain a mooring at that uh, depth and we were fortunate enough to meet uh, Jim Thompson who has a larger project already operating uh, in, the, in the Narrows and he will um, sort of elaborate on that uh, after my presentation. So I don't want to preempt his, his talk and just sort of focus on the essentials. We deploy the instrument at 65 meters, uh, we have our typical uh, sensors uh, mounted to his equipment, that's sort of a uh, bottom-mounted sea spider. I'm sure we hear more about that. And we measure salinity, temperature, oxygen, pressure, and current speed and direction. <coughs> okay, now we have two years of data of that uh, exploratory uh, collaboration, and now we can sort of, in a larger context, evaluate uh, the importance of the data. And what I would like to do is use basically three guiding questions to walk you through the data and hopefully sort of show you how important that information is on a larger scale. Well, <clears throat> if these intrusions occur into Puget Sound, um, we are basically interested whether they occur at a time that Puget Sound is already vulnerable for low oxygen concentrations. And uh, <clears throat> for that I've taken uh, David Mora's graph here. Um, and he shows uh, the seasonal cycle of oxygen concentrations in blue. So that's time uh, versus concentration. You see in February there's a peak that is very high in oxygen, which is indicative that you have a lot of vertical mixing in Admiralty Reach. So it's a very dynamic uh, environment. But then oxygen continuously declines to a minimum in September. And then sort of bounces back during the winter months. You can also look at the variability of all the data, so we measure in, in uh, 30 minute intervals, and you see that there is uh, sort of very little variation in the winter months, that means that the gradients across Admiralty Reach are not very steep. But during the decline, you see that the gradient really picks up, we have sort of maximum variation in the data set during that time when oxygen is already declining. Raising the question sort of where is that lower oxygen, the lower bound coming from? Is that coming from Puget Sound or is that coming potentially from the ocean? 
And salinity does much more what, what is expected, sort of lower salinity here in yellow in the winter months because of fresh water. But then there's a peak uh, that is coinciding with the lowest oxygen concentrations <coughs> in late summer. And so the question is, is that just because of the freshwater balance that we have more salinity here? Or is that because we have uh, saltier water potentially being attracted into the straits that can make it uh, into Admiralty Reach? <coughs> So I would like to explore that association between higher salinity and uh, oxygen, dissolved oxygen, a little further to see whether we have uh, an oceanic source. And what Dave has done is he separated basically um, the three seasons out and plotted salinity versus uh, the oxygen signal. So remember, we don't have a direction yet, so we're just uh, at the moment still guessing. But you see that in the summer, you have a strong relation. The saltier the water becomes, sort of the lower the oxygen um, uh, in the water column, which is already a strong indication that it's per, uh, potentially oceanic in origin. And then in the fall, this signal begins to erode away. But you can have concentrations as low as uh, four mix. If you think about the water quality standard for oxygen, this is already way below it. OK. so. Um, I would like to sort of highlight the strength of the mooring in a sort of tidally active uh, environment because we can take that oxygen signal and separate it into in and outgoing tides that gives us a sense of direction of the signal. And so uh, what Dave has done is he sort of took an average for all the in and outgoing uh, DO concentrations <coughs> over time and basically if you don't have a net flux of oxygen in any direction you would expect the two lines to coincide like here. But if there's a discrepancy, let's say there's more oxygen going out or in, you would see a sort of a discrepancy between the two lines. And what we see is that there are certain events when all of a sudden they do not coincide. So for simplicity, I would like to take that seasonal cycle out by just subtracting the two from each other. So it's a relative um, projection of the data. So if basically the in-going oxygen measurements and the outgoing measurements are uh, sort of the same, you would expect basically the data falling onto a zero line. But what you see is that during uh, particular times uh, in late summer, when already the overall oxygen concentrations are low in Puget Sound, you have an intrusion of more salt. So negative values imply that you have an import of salt, so a net import of salt to the straits that can last uh, for several weeks and then declines again and picks up again. Same for energy, we have a net export of energy to Admiralty Reach at 65 meters. <clears throat> and when you look at oxygen, we have actually an uh, export of oxygen from Puget Sound out into the Straits, so which is counterintuitive. I mean, if you flip that in your head, you can say if we export oxygen from Puget Sound into the Straits, that means that we're importing lower oxygen water into Puget Sound from the Straits, right? Okay. So, so we saw that basically these intrusions of low oxygen water occur in distinct sort of pulses. And so the question that we had is, is the signal potentially predictable or is it occurring randomly? And um, <clears throat> the predict predictability is important because it allows us to link larger scale pattern and processes to these events that occur at Admiralty Reach as a sort of predictive uh, tool. And uh, David again plotted uh, the oxygen sort of uh, concentrations here in blue in the same sort of graphical format and overlaid the upwelling index. So it seems that, you know, when you have you can have these intrusions occurring all the time, but you need to have sort of a condition that sort of preps it for a low intrusion of oxygen to occur. And so what he's done is he overlaid the upwelling index in green here. And if you see a positive anomaly, that means we have strong upwelling that brings in low oxygen water. And that coincides uh, with these pulses of low oxygen water into the Straits, uh, into uh, Puget Sound. So it seems like you have to have the, the big system has to be just ripe for this uh, intrusion um, to uh, occur, so it has to prep it. But then we see these dis uh, distinct pulses, and what um, David has done is he's taken a smaller section of the data set and blown it up here in blue to highlight these pulses. 
and he is looking uh, just as a proxy for uh, the fourth night cycle at the variability of tidal height. So a spring tide, you have a lot of variability in the tidal height. And so if you just plot tidal height here in black, that would be a peak. If you have a neap tide, you have very little variation. So you would be in a through. So this is not very scientific, but it is a good way of illustrating the point, I think, very nicely. So each time you have a peak, it's a spring time. And if you have a through, you have a neap tide. And what you see is that these intrusions of low oxygen water occur pretty predictable at neap tides. So that very much is uh, consistent with our understanding of estuarian circulation processes. And uh, authors, Canadian authors have found a similar process going through Harrow Strait into Georgia Basin. So this is very consistent with uh, our understanding of estuarine flow. Okay, so <clears throat> in summary for my introduction to set the stage for, for Jim's part, I would like to um, <coughs> summarize why or like to, <coughs> like to summarize why we would like to continue a mooring in Admiralty Reach. So um, first of all, the assumption that low DO is dominated by processes that are intrinsic to Puget Sound is inconclusive because the oceanic signal can be so large at times. So we need to constrain that also better for modeling. Um, through the collaboration with APL, we have now important data access to support uh, ecology's marine water quality assessment uh, exercises and also uh, model simulations. So <clears throat> I strongly sort of uh, um, support this collaboration because it, it's been just very, very productive and so far we haven't paid uh, much dollars into it. Basically it was picked up by larger programs, but we're going to hear that in a second. And the preliminary data uh, shows already that um, Processes in the estuary in large scale pattern have to sort of come together for these intrusions to occur. So basically, these measurements, even though they're just a point source, give us a lot of information how large scale processes interact and sort of affect uh, the conduit of low DO water uh, through Admiralty Reach. Okay, and with that, I would like to sort of hand over the uh, talk to Jim Thompson. You don't need this. <laughs> Thank you, Christopher. Um, so I think that's a perfect intro uh, to, to my half of the talk. Uh, and I want to just keep going on this, this thread that the, the, the ocean and Puget Sound are uh, very connected. And there are all these processes that, that tie them together. And you can't consider one without the other. And of course, just by geometry, the place where all that happens is Admiralty Inlet. So there's Port Townsend. And, and there's that, uh, that inlet, which is about seven kilometers across and about 60 meters deep. And it's really where all the water comes and goes for Puget Sound. A little bit of water goes through Deception Pass, but by volume, it's, it's tiny. Even though it's pretty dramatic when you stand there on the bridge, it's, it's really tiny compared to Admiralty Inlet. Uh, so here's this nice image of the work we've been doing there, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But the, the three things I want to hit uh, are to talk about some of the, the fluid dynamics that are happening there that are tied to this question of how does oceanic water get into Puget Sound, and what does that mean for water quality? Uh, and then I'll tell you a little bit about how we do the moorings up there because it's an unusual spot to work. And then uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, the other reason that we're working there, which is the Tidal Energy Project. Um, and it, it seems like there's a lot of curiosity around that project, so I thought I'd uh, tell you a little bit about that. So um, I want to go back to, uh, to Christopher's nice schematic, which I've sort of minimized up there in the upper left corner. Um, but that's that schematic we're looking at how Puget Sound works and all the processes of Puget Sound. I really like that schematic. I think it captures a lot of things, shows you how complicated the natural system is. And what I want to do is zoom in now to this little section at Admiralty Reach. And this is the sill where, uh, where the, the flow is constricted both in the horizontal and in the vertical. So you can think about it, it's, it's really a bottleneck. You've got all this water in Puget Sound that has to squeeze through there. And you get a lot of really fascinating fluid dynamics happening there. And Christopher's got these great arrows that show you some of these processes. And the first one, the easy one, is the tide. Right? The tide comes and goes uh, and over that sill. And uh, here's some of our data, just a snapshot of what, what it looks like uh, to measure the currents, the tidal currents at that site. So this plot is, goes from uh, the bottom, this is the seabed, up to the surface, so again, about 60 meters deep. And this is just two days of data. We have three years of data now, so this is just a snapshot of the data. 
in time, two days, and the color scale is the strength of the current. So over this two day period, the, the red is two and a half meters per second, or about five knots. So this is sort of moderate conditions uh, in, in Admiralty Inlet. Uh, and you see the tides come and go twice a day. Um, that's where everybody knows that, right? Uh, and you see, you see the ebb flood, ebb flood, so on and so forth. Uh, we have mixed tides on the west coast, so some of these, the, these are stronger <coughs> tides than weaker tides, than stronger tides, right? So they, uh, they come and go twice a day. It's a pretty simple story. But then you start looking at some of the details in the flow, and you realize there, there are quite a few details. So there's a little less flow near the bottom. There's friction at the bottom. It's a boundary layer, so there's less flow down there. Um, there are some features where the tides sort of come up and then come back down, and this is related to that constriction where the the, uh, the water gets stuck behind a headland, forms a bunch of eddies, and then pushes through and around. So in many ways, Admiralty Inlet looks more like a whitewater in a river, uh, where you get all sorts of interesting features. Um, so, so there's quite a bit more detail in here, and that's one of the strengths of the observational program there, is we're starting to look at, at some of these details. And it's much more complicated than just saying the tide comes and goes twice a day. OK, so that's just two days of data. Well, uh, like I said, we have a lot of data. So if you look over longer time scales, again, the same kind of plot, seabed to surface, uh, and time on this axis, this is now uh, three months of data. Um, and the color scale had to change a little bit, because over those the three months, we get currents that are about 3.5. Um, the actual maximum we get over long term is four meters per second, which is eight knots. Uh, and so you see all sorts of things happening here. Um, but the predominant one, the one I want to stress, is you see the springs and the meeps. Uh, and so that, those are the, the warmer colors here, the stronger tides happening here. Uh, those are spring tides. Those occur when the, the moon is in line with the sun. So you get the gravitational effect of both. So those are new moons and full moons. And then when we're at right angles to the moon, the gravitational effect is less. And so that's a neap tide. And that's these lighter colors here. And you just have a less strong tide. Uh, and so those are you know, the half moons. So that happens twice a month. You get spring tides and, and neap tides. And uh, in a place like Admiralty Inlet, that's a, a very strong signal. You know, where the, at spring tides, we're getting up to four meters per second. Uh, and in some of the neap tides, we're more like you know, one. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a factor of two or even three different sometimes. So uh, there's a lot of variability on, on these time scales. So, uh, what does all that mean for the other things in the schematic? Well, the thing that uh, is most significant or we're most interested in for the purpose of water quality is this arrow. This is, the, uh, this is that potential to have overflow, to have water coming in from the ocean. And that's part of what we call the exchange flow. So this is something that's happening at the same time the tides are happening. These are all superimposed together, right? This, this arrow is, is there all the time. Uh, but there's also this underlying exchange flow. And the, the basic way to think of the exchange flow is simply that, uh, that there's fresh water coming out at the surface. And so that's, you know, there would be another little arrow going to the right here. And there's dense water coming in. And so in, in total, there's a, there's a mass balance or, or, uh, there that where there's, you, you lose as much fresh water as you gain salt water. And you're not filling up either base. You're conserving the amount of water. Um, and that's really what happens at uh, a river mouth or any estuary. And uh, what we don't often think about, but I think is, is quite true, is that all of Puget Sound is actually an estuary. There are estuaries at the Skagit River mouth, and at the Duwamish, and all, all, all these smaller features. But the whole place acts like an estuary also. So that, that feature, that exchange flow, happens at, uh, to the whole system, where we're generally losing fresh water at the surface and having salt water come, come into the bottom. And that, that's the net exchange flow. Well, that exchange flow is very strongly modulated by, by the tides, um, certainly according to theory and in our data. Um, this is that same data record we were just looking at, the previous slide, where I was looking at the strength of the tides. If I take the tides out of this, I low pass filter this, then, I get, then we get this. Um, and this is, again, uh, from the bottom of the surface. And you can see the tidal height there, so you can see where the neaps are occurring. Um, this is now very different axis, color axis here. This is in, uh, this is, goes from 0.1 or minus 0.2, uh, so this is tenths of meters per second here. 
Um, but this is the subtitle exchange flow that's going on. So this is in the net, how much water is going in or out of Puget Sound. And you see that the most of the action occurs on these neat tides. So there's a neat tide, there's a neat tide, there's a neat tide. And that's when there's a very strong outflow at the surface. This is the surface is up here, down about the middle. And then the strong blue colors here, that's a strong inflow happening at depth. So this is uh, sort of a classic result, uh, but nicely shown in field data. And there, uh, uh, there are, certainly from a location like this, there's not a lot of, of data um, available to look at. So it's nice to see this matching theory. And if, if this seems a little counterintuitive, that you get more exchange during weaker tides, then you can sort of step back and think about, well, what if there were no tides at all, right? Well, if there are no tides at all, then the system just acts like an estuary, right? Fresh water goes out, salt water comes in, that happens. As the tides become more and more important to the system, and they superimpose and happen with that, then they actually serve to, uh, to, to stop that dynamic or, or work against that dynamic because they are moving water back and forth so much that the, the underlying rather weak exchange flow doesn't have a chance to get the water in. So, you know, you, um, so in the limit of no tides, you get a lot of exchange flow. As you get more and more tides, that begins to retard the exchange flow. So if you have a modulation in the tides, you get the most exchange flow when you have the least tides. Um, so this is really consistent with the analysis that David and Christopher have done, showing that if there's upwelling out in the deep ocean that preconditions everything to have low DO water available, then you're going to see it make a difference at the deep tide. That's when there's a physical hydrodynamic mechanism to get this arrow, to get this water coming in over the sill and to get the fresh water leaving at the top. And then you have a net export of oxygen or import of low oxygen. Um, and then, of course, the next question is, well, what happens once it gets over here? Right? I mean, this is the, I, I, we continue to, to think this is the important thing is the boundary condition. Right? Admiralty Inlet is the gateway which everything comes and goes through, but there's certainly uh, a, a much larger question as to what happens once it gets in. Well, once it gets in, it starts to mix. And, uh, and that mixing uh, occurs because of turbulence. And so that's something else we've been looking at at the site that I won't spend a lot of time on. Um, but that's this, this last uh, set of arrows in, the, in this magnetic diagram. There's, there's mixing going on. And uh, this plot here is, is now back to just a short snippet of data just by way of example. Um, this is pulling out a single single height. Uh, so uh, before I was showing you profiles of the current, now I'm just showing you at one level, uh, about halfway up in the water, uh, what, the, what the raw data of the currents look like. So this is two days, I'm sorry, this is one day, this is 24 hours of time, and this is just the, the speed of the current. And the solid line, which you might have a hard time picking out, is the, uh, the five minute average of the tides. And so you see ebb flood, ebb flood. Right? Um, but then you see all the scatter around it. The scatter is the raw data collected at one hertz, one point per second. And you see there's tremendous scatter. Now a little bit of that is just noise in the instrumentation, but we've been very careful to remove as much of that as possible. Most of that is actually true turbulence. So you have a mean flow that is two and a half meters per second, five knots, very fast, right? But you have turbulent fluctuations around that that are, you know, 0.5 meters per second. There, and so if, if this were uh, you know, a mountain pass, it's really gusty, right? The mean flow, yes, is one indication of what's happening there, but the gusts are, are very important. And, and if you're actually standing there or working there or doing something there, um, that's the feature you really notice is all that turbulence. And that's again because of this bottleneck, forcing all this water through this narrow and shallow region. And just like in a river, that, that generates a lot of, of turbulence. So, uh, this is something we've been spending a lot of time just trying to measure and then trying to understand uh, from there. And this is also going to be a big part of the story as, as to what happens when you have the upwelling conditions and the neap exchange conditions that will make this happen. Now, and there's, a, there's a, another layer to that story there where this turbulence mostly modulates with the strength of the tides. So there's less turbulence on the neap tides which is when there's the potential for low oxygen water to make it in. So when this arrow is happening, low oxygen water coming in, this is a, is a weaker mechanism. 
So that actually can exacerbate the, the process, right? Because you don't have the, the energetic flow available to mix things up. Uh, so this can stay as a nice quiescent layer that just sneaks in over the sill and makes it down into the basin. Um, so there's another competing mechanism there. Uh, some of the things we do with the turbulence data is we look at the length scales of the data, and this is just uh, for fun to show you some of our analysis that's going on in this. We look at the uh, percent of turbulence carried in different length scales. So this is the percent of turbulence on this axis, and these are the length scales in meters here. And we see at Admiralty Head uh, that there's a really broad distribution of all these different length scales. And, and that's what it looks like when you're standing on the deck of a ship there, or if you go to the, uh, the uh, Fort Casey State Park and, and look out, there are all these eddies and all these different motions happening in all these different length scales. There's sort of a preferential or a very weak broad peak here at about 150, 200 meters. And that's consistent with some theories of the eddy generation by the headland. So this is sort of an, an expected result that tells you that um, there's energy at all these different scales from the very fine little eddies up to the really big ones. Um, but there's some, something here that sort of dominates. Um, and, and that's related to the size of the headland and the, and the water depth. So we understand this turbulence a little bit, um, but we're still we're certainly still working on it. Okay, so, so that's what's happening hydrodynamically at the sill, and, and that's how it's relevant to, to understanding the, the oxygen coming in. Um, now I want to talk a little bit just about how we get this data, because uh, this is a, something I spend a lot of time on, and I think is really interesting just how to, how to do this. Uh, so basically the question is at the top of the slide there, how do you withstand four meters per second? How do you keep an instrument in place four meters per second. So that's equal to eight knots. Well, remember the water is very dense, about 800 times more dense than air. So that is actually the equivalent of trying to hold something in place in 3,000 meters per second of wind, which is completely non-physical comparison, right? Because that's, what is it, Mach 10, right? I mean, that's not, that's not really a physical number. But, but if you've walked outside in a hurricane and tried to just hold your ground against the wind in a hurricane, it's, it's very difficult. It's not a good idea. <laughs> and so this is a lot worse than trying, this is several orders of magnitude worse than trying to hold yourself uh, in place in a hurricane. So uh, Chris had a nice picture earlier of, of us deploying one of these. Um, and here's a, a, a close up of, of a sea spider. This is something I've been using in my research for about 10 years now that we've adapted to this project. And the number one adaptation is lead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so they're balanced with about 800 pounds of lead now which seems like a simple enough idea, you can just go buy more lead, uh, but, um, but then everything else has to go up with that because suddenly all the loads through the whole system have, have gone up dramatically. Um, so the rest of what's on here, here is uh, Ecology CTDO, um, and uh, that's been out since August 2009. It's been a great collaboration where Ecology provides the instrument, does uh, the, the inner calibrations, uh, we meet up in Port Townsend when we're doing these turnarounds, and, and uh, we're working on the rest of our gear, and then they work on that, and uh, it's just been very fluid collaboration. Um, uh, no pun intended. The other things we measure up there are, we measure the noise, the ambient noise. Uh, that's with a hydrophone. Um, that's been a really interesting project because uh, obvious after the fact, not obvious going into it, uh, it's very loud there because Puget Sound is ostensibly a highway. We have so much traffic coming and going, going to Seattle, going to Tacoma, that if you s stay there and listen for a very long time, like three years, uh, you build up quite a, a, a record of noise, and the statistics are, are staggering. It, it really is like having a house next to the highway. Um, so that's something that's a complete aside to this, but it's something that we, uh, I, need, I think we need to think about as we get more data on this urban waterway, is to think about all these different things that are happening and, and different, uh, influences that, that we, the people who live here, are having on this, this waterway. Uh, the other thing that's on here is the, this uh, instrument in the center there, that's an ADCP, Acoustic Doppler Current Profile. That's how we get those nice color plots of the currents. Uh, that sends a sonar ping up into the water, and then it processes the echo that comes back at different levels, and we get the currents from that. Uh, uh, a few other things to record, the presence of porpoise and the presence of tagged fish, usually endangered species are tagged. Um, and then there's a, uh, a, the, everything else on here is basically to, to put it down or to get it back. Uh, so that float in the far uh, left-hand side there, 
Um, that float stays down there with the instrument, and then when we're ready to recover it, this, this is completely standalone when it's on the seafloor. So we lower this down and let go of it, and it sits there for three months, typically, uh, completely self-contained. And then we're, and it, so everything is recorded on board. There's no real-time data. It's all stored in flash memory in each individual instrument. And then to recover it, uh, we send an acoustic, a, a sonar ping to uh, a release that is located just below that float. So the float is held in during the whole three-month deployment. Upon receiving that remote command, it opens a lever and that float heads to the surface by its own buoyancy, uh, connected to a piece of line which looks like dental floss, but it's rated to 12,000 pounds. So we grab the float, we tie into that line, and we, when we pull the whole thing up. And that's where the 800 pounds gets tricky, right? because, uh, because you don't want very much line to be flopping around down there. Um, you can't afford the space, and certainly once it gets to the surface, you don't want much line in the water when the currents are racing. And we try to do all of this when the tides are changing. We call it slack water, right? You don't want to be out during the maximum flood. You don't want to be out during the maximum ebb. But that's a cartoon. Slack water doesn't really exist in Admiralty Inlet. There are physical reasons for that, actually, that coming over the sill, the tide changes at the bottom first and then at the top. So you might be on the surface and say, oh, it's slack, there's nothing moving. But the tide's already racing ahead of you down below. Um, so there, there's basically no time that's perfect to, to do this work. So uh, that's another reason to have as little drag in the water as possible. Um, so there's been a lot of engineering that's gone into this, a lot of work that's gone into this. Um, and I have to say, when we started this project in, in 2009, before we did our first deployment, I went and did my homework like I would do for any other place that I'm about to start a field campaign. And I looked for what data is out there. Right? I talked to everyone I know, um, looked, scoured the place for data, and uh, the response I got across the board was, you have to be psychotic to measure something there. <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, so I, it's, I'm, I'm very proud to say we have all this data now. Uh, we're, still, we're still going. We just did a turnaround uh, two weeks ago. Uh, we've totaled 21 deployments because we have multiple of these platforms, each of them about three months long. That amounts to 31,000 hours of gear on the seabed measuring uh, something with a 99% data return and 100% return of the equipment. So that little 1% is just a malfunctioning microprocessor somewhere in one of those cases. Um, uh, so I think it's a good track record in a tough spot. Um, and now I want to yeah. tell you the, the reasons we've been doing this, uh, which are tangential to the, the, the dissolved oxygen uh, study in some ways, but I think they're all tied together nicely in the end. Um, the Snohomish Public Utility District has proposed a tidal energy project at this site. This is what the project will look like, proposed project. Uh, two turbines made by a company uh, called Open Hydro, a company that's based uh, out of Europe in the UK, and they're each six meters in diameter. So that distance is six meters across. So they're pretty big, if they were you know, here in this room, it'd take up a lot of the room, but they're small compared to the, the location. Right? 60 meters depth, they'll, they'll barely be up off the bottom. Right? Um, and they're small compared to 7,000 meters across the inlet. Uh, so they sit on these foundations, which are, uh, which, uh, they beat our 800 pounds of lead hands down. <laughs> um, they weigh about 300 tons each. Um, but that is their entire stability, is their, is their weight. Uh, so they're lowered to the seabed like this, and then cables plug into them. Uh, a couple of neat things about this project. One is that it's a pilot project. And that really means it's a research project. And, and I have been involved in this project for four years now and I've been very impressed how, how much a public utility, whose job is really just to get us power to our houses, uh, is so committed to a research project. They are not going to make any money, or certainly they've just lost money, uh, or hardly any power out of it. The, the project is to learn, try two of these, see if there are any environmental impacts that need to be worried, do they need to be addressed, that are, or anything that's completely a showstopper, uh, see how this works operationally, does this make sense, and basically figure out over the course of five to ten years of these operating, if it makes sense to go the next step. And the next step might only be ten of them. Uh, you know, it's, it's probably a generation away before there would be a hundred of these, if ever. And, and the answer at the end of these two might be no. That's, that's research. Right? Uh, so I think they've taken a very uh, uh, 
prudent approach to this, both in terms of the science and in terms of their own um, development of resources. So uh, that's the description of the project. It's uh, the total production at peak flow is about uh, one megawatt. Um, so that's pretty similar to a lot of the wind turbines that are out right now. Um, of course, the wind turbines are enormous, right? And, the, and these are able to make a similar amount of power from much less area because the water is so much more dense, right? So you get the same amount of kinetic energy flux or power from uh, something that's much smaller in the water than in the wind. Uh, they turn very slowly so that they don't cavitate, so they only rotate at about 12 RPMs, very slow, much slower than you pedal a bicycle. Um, so there's sort of these you know, heavy, slow, lumbering turbines, uh, which may be deployed in 2013. I say may because there's still several regulatory hurdles that they're working through now. Um, uh, I'm optimistic that the, the project will go forward, but there, there's definitely, there's, there's been a lot of work and a lot of work continues uh, to make sure that, that all of the various agencies, ecology included, who have authority to permit uh, in-water projects are, are satisfied. Um, so what we're doing at UW is we're leading the pre-installation site characterization, which means basically comprehensively everything you'd want to know about what is in Admiralty Inlet presently. And that's both from an environmental standpoint and an operational standpoint. So that they know what it's going to look like when they put these down, but so that we also have, I, I'm very cautious using the term baseline, but we have some information about what was there before these went in. We have context, and context is a better word than baseline. Um, and then the other thing we've recently started working on is developing the tools, techniques, and methods to do the post-installation monitoring. These are deployed in 2013, then how do we continue to monitor from there and, and, and put that data in the context of what we have. Okay, so that's what's coming. This is all done under the auspices of the Northwest National Marine <coughs> Renewable Energy Center. Uh, and this center, uh, I won't read the page to you, but the center was uh, funded three years ago, four years ago, by the U.S. Department of Energy. So this is a federal grant to both the University of Washington and Oregon State University to be the research arm uh, of a national effort to, to move forward with marine energy, to understand both from the technical side what can be done, what's feasible, and from the environmental side, what is sustainable, what makes sense, what can be done without uh, adverse effects. So uh, it's a big project, a lot of different people involved, a lot of different departments involved at each of the universities. There's something like a total of, of 25 faculty members involved. Um, so, it gets carved up pretty quickly, uh, but it ends up you know, producing a, a, a sort of comprehensive view of this topic. And this has been the majority of the funding that has supported the, the work you've heard about today. Um, there's also been a, a additional funding from Snohomish PUD themselves to keep that program going. Uh, we also have several national partners that are helping in this, some local, Pacific Northwest National Lab. It's a great local resource. Um, there's a lot of collaboration on modeling with them, but also on some field measurements. Um, and some of the other national labs are involved also. So uh, where are we going from here, both in terms of the center, in terms of Admiralty and that project? Um, the the long-term vision for what will happen in Admiralty is to uh, about really almost two years from now, two years from now, to have a turbine, two turbines deployed and have real-term monitor, real-time monitoring. By real-time, I mean that there is a package of uh, instruments and sensors that is on the seabed with the turbine, and the turbine is cabled anyway with a fiber optic line. It's as big a pipe as you want. You can send all the data you want. It's sort of my dream come true. Um, and uh, so that, that backbone is there so we can add on a lot of environmental instruments and get a lot of data through that backbone. So that's where we're going, is real-time monitoring, which is, uh, which is a really unique thing. I mean, that uh, whatever your opinion may be of the Tidal Energy Project, that is quite a, a boon for Puget Sound, to have that kind of real-time data from the key gateway to Puget Sound. Um, so, uh, and where this takes us is really uh, into a continuous long-term uh, DO data set for the site. Starting in August 2009, that data set gets better every day, right? Only one day at a time, but, but every day. And, and you know, by the time we get to 2013, then you're really starting to, to get to these longer time scales that David and Christopher have been looking at. Um, and so uh, we want to continue this collaboration. Uh, the, the plan is absolutely to have a CTDO on this, this larger environmental monitoring system. Um, 
and to continue to, to basically piece this together uh, from a diverse set of funding, from federal grants, uh, from the Department of Energy, from the Sonoma Public Utility District, um, to continue to make this happen. A challenge we have right now, admittedly, is to fill uh, the gap in, in funding for this in the upcoming year or so. Um, the, the federal grant is winding down, has wound down, uh, and the support from Snohomish is winding down because they really have to focus on just getting these permits. And so, uh, to me, scientifically, it is, uh, it's, it's awful, but they basically they're willing to live with a gap of data between this pre-installation effort and the installation effort because we just can't afford to do it. Um, so the other part of our collaboration, Christopher and I, is to write proposals. And uh, we've had two unsuccessful to date, but that doesn't mean we're done trying, um, to, to have enough funding to basically fill this gap and get us to the point where we have the magic yellow line bringing data to shore in 2013. Um, so that's, our, that's a big effort right now is to, to try to figure out how to keep this data set going because in a long time series, once you miss it, it's gone. Right? And, uh, and I think the location is, is very unique and key to understanding the overall system. If you don't know what's coming in and out of the system, you can't understand the rest of the system. Uh, so uh, that, I think, wraps up the two of us. And uh, we just want to thank all these people, especially my team at the Applied Physics Lab. Uh, there's a lot of hard work that goes into to keeping these things up and running, a lot of attention to detail, every shackle, every bolt, every nut. Uh, guys like Joe Talbert, Alex DeClerc, and, uh, and our captain, Andy Railers, they, they really uh, make a big difference in getting these things done and, and having those success rates. Uh, and then Brian Palagi is faculty of mechanical engineering. He now, as the director of the, the Energy Center, um, he's a uh, key person in making all this happen. Uh, and then uh, the rest of these guys are, are grad students, well, except David, um, <laughs> uh, who, uh, who are out on the ship with us and, and doing a lot of the, the data crunching and, um, and making a lot of this happen. So, thanks. Great. Questions from the room. I want to check in with the regions and see if anybody out there and the and another world has any questions for the presenters. Anybody? No. Okay. How about in the room then? What's, what's oh. the cost of these projects? If you could repeat the question. Ah, uh, what's the cost of these projects? Um, uh, I'll try to build you from the bottom up. To be out there with our ship operating for a day is about ten thousand dollars for a day. Um, the ship itself doesn't cost that much. It's more like uh, 2,500 for the day. But by the time uh, we've mobilized and we have, you know, a team of four or five people on board, um, you know, to really get this done is about, you know, it's about $10,000 per day while we're out doing the field work. Um, and right now, that happens four times a year for uh, four days apiece. So you know, there's 160k right there. Um, and uh, of course, that just gets the data, doesn't get it analyzed. Um, and, and all of that is just the operational cost. Now the backbone of all of this, which has already been supported from the big federal grants, is the instrumentation, the platforms. And so to, to make a sea spider, especially the, the, the specialized ones for this location, um, that's about 100 grand of development per one of those. So, you know, I think what's What's gotten us to this point is on the order of a, a million dollars of funding. Um, that is, um, that sounds like a tremendous amount of money, I realize. Um, but you have to understand how much that's spread across a lot of different development efforts and uh, I would admit a pretty scrappy approach to piecing together pieces of funding to, to have all the tools and all the people assembled to go do these things. And it, um, we basically have a lot of other projects and field work that supports these capabilities, having the ship, having the gear, having the people, all that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, what Christopher and I are looking at now just to be able to fill that data gap here, that's, that's, a, that's a much more modest number. 20, 30K, you know, would, would fill that gap for us. Um, so we just need to go find it. Anybody else from the region? Um, because of my background in oceanography, whenever I, when I first started hearing about tidal energy, I kind of had an, an initial negative, you know, reaction because, and I know this is going to be a simplistic question and a complicated answer, but um, 
anything, you know, in, in Puget Sound where we're challenged with problems of, of hypoxia and whatnot, anything that would reduce circulation, you can sort of think of as, as bad, mm -hmm. you know. And so if you've got a, a mooring that has these big turbines that's obviously decreasing circulation, you think that might be bad. But of course now it occurs to me that this is at the bottom and this is where you've got the ocean, oceanic intrusion of the low DO water. So maybe it's actually a good selling point for these things <laughs> that you're going to decrease hypoxia. <laughs> there, Can you comment on that? Uh, um, I think you've, you've, actually, you've absolutely identified the right mechanism, that these turbines will make a wake which they basically act to stir the water, right? So on those neap tides, which don't have as much turbulence, but have the DO intrusion, these turbines could be stirring up that intrusion so that it doesn't go further into the basin and, and, and make problems, quote unquote. Um, that's a hypothesis that needs a lot of data to test it. I, I mean, that's just a hypothesis. Um, for now, the effect of two turbines is so tiny that I, I, I think that's completely immeasurable. I mean, it would take a, you know, hundreds of turbines literally to see that mechanism really play out and make a difference to water quality in Puget Sound. My expectation is we'll have a limit long before that from other things. For example, if you put enough turbines in that begins to, like you said, reduce the circulation, begins to change the tidal range in Puget Sound. So that tidal flats out in the Skagit Bay where you'd like to go get clams might actually not be inundated quite as long because the tide will come up a few centimeters less than it used to. Now, these are all the big scenarios, hundreds of turbines, right? So all we can do right now is model those and you know, generate well-informed hypotheses about those. We can't really get there. So um, I think you've got the right mechanism. I think the, uh, and I think certainly one of the big things I want to do when the two turbines are installed is study their wake. How much do they increase the turbulence locally? For those two turbines, I think it'll be very much a local effect. We see more turbulence, we see a wake. Uh, you see that in wind farms, same physics, right? Um, I think the net effect of it for the system will be negligible for two turbines, but we'll have a chance to see exactly what it looks like, and then you can start multiplying by 100 and see what that means, right? So, I mean, that's, I guess that's why a lot of uh, people are now, they like the term environmental effects, because the effect may actually be positive, right? Um, that's a subjective thing, but they, so, so I mean, we want to get the science right to determine the, the mechanism and then go from there. Um, just to um, further that a bit, so each turbine, uh, one megawatt, right? And then um, say due to inefficiencies, um, it's quote unquote harvesting five megawatts of uh, power from the flow. What's a back of the envelope calculation for the amount of power flowing through mm. Admiralty Reach? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, there's a there's a lot of effort on this. Uh, right now, I'm I'm serving on a panel from the uh, National Academies on what is the total available tidal resource for all the U.S. So count up Maine and Alaska and all these things. Um, and it's actually pretty hard to get a great number. And of course, what Congress wants is just a number, right? right. Tell me the gigawatts, right? And, uh, and we say, well, but, but. <laughs> so, so I'll give you uh, the, the, the easy number is to say, and this would never happen, but to say, what happens if you put a dam across Puget Sound? That's a, or, or a barrage, right? Like the, like the one in France. Um, we'd never do it, but that is actually the most power you get out of Puget Sound, right? Um, and that number is uh, about a gigawatt or a thousand megawatts, right? Um, so you can, you can come at it from the other ways and, and build it up from one turbine at a time, one megawatt at a time, and uh, either way you come up with sort of a similar order of magnitude that you could, you could probably take up to 100 megawatts out of Admiralty Inlet without having a dramatic effect throughout the rest of Puget Sound. So you could probably do about 100 turbines, which might be when you run out of space, real estate anyway. Um, now, 100 megawatts, that's still a, that's a pretty sizable coal-fired power plant. I mean, that's a, that's a bunch of electricity, right? Um, so it doesn't mean it's not worth doing. But that, those are where the orders of magnitude are. Um, that, you know, there's about a gigawatt available. You could probably take 10% of that or less before you start to really have systemic effects that are, that are really substantial. Um, and you would do that with order of 100 turbines. And, and your point about the dissipation is, is correct. That, you know, there, there's all this inefficiency in it. So you, you take energy out of the flow and only some of that goes into making power. There's a limit on the efficiency of the turbine and there's all the, the loss in the wake. The wake mixes, the wake also loses uh, 
mean kinetic energy. It loses it to turbulence. Do you have a number for that? The no, there actually there have been no measurements of the wake of these devices. Well, no, but I mean like. Uh, oh. Uh, um, oh, the turbines are about 30% efficient. Okay. Um, they're limited by a theoretical limit called the, the Betts limit, which is 56%. Um, so no one's ever going to build a turbine, turbine bigger than that. If you ever hear someone selling one bigger than that, they, they missed a freshman class. Um, and, uh, and then the wake losses are, you know, another 10, 20%. It, that's not very well constrained. Um, we have a project now to go measure a prototype turbine and see what those wake losses but, are. So just order of magnitude of one megawatt uh, turbine is taking out about two megawatts. Sure, yeah. Could you briefly summarize the question for the, oh, sorry. the, the, uh, the people on the phone? So the question was, what's the, yeah, what's the most you can get out of that? Any other questions? There's one in the back there. Okay. I just had a question. It seems like the, the, because there's high turbulence, it isn't necessarily a good place to have uh, and power generation. So how do you balance mm -hmm. turbulence against yeah. The velocities that you might get for generating power? That is an excellent question, and one that has the engineers uh, up at night, um, very much so. Um, many of the prototypes have been tested around the world. You know, this is very all very new technology still, right? This is 20 years behind where wind is. There's, there's a lot of prototyping going on right now. Almost across the board, every prototype that's been deployed in the ocean has had some sort of catastrophic failure quickly after deployment. Um, my opinion is most of that is, is uh, incomplete understanding or measurement of the turbulence. You know? uh, uh, and so you, know, you get these gusts of turbulence that really put incredible stresses and strains and loads on these systems. And you know, a, a turbine blade that's out here has a phenomenal amount of leverage on the, the joint you know, where it's attached to the center hub. Right? Um, so it's something that is, is a big concern for designing these things, and it really, at the end, is going to come down to the economics. How much additional steel and reinforcement do you have to put into one of these things to, to make it survive the turbulence that's there? And once you've made it that robust, does it even make sense to deploy it anymore? Right? So for example, the original proposal for those turbines was 10-meter turbines, and they have downsized them to 6-meter turbines largely as a response to our data set. I'm just an observation and then a question and then probably I think uh, one of the challenges with these kinds of things is also lo matching load to, to the generation. I mean, mm -hmm. you can see from the velocities you're going to get maximum generation during like spring and deep mm -hmm. floods and then, but then you're going to have times when it's slack so the energy generation is going to be like doing going all over the place over time and matching that to load. They're having a big problem right now with wind power mm -hmm. and, and trying to match wind power loads when you've got spring runoff and maximum dam production, mm -hmm. and BPA is going nuts because if they cut back wind power, then they lose their federal money and mm -hmm. so on. So there's some real so, so system-wide challenges on putting that in. You make a great point, um, but this is actually this is one point where tidal energy really shines, actually, because it's not quite all over the place as you just described. Um, it's predictable, predictable, yeah, right, and that's an enormous difference from wind, which is forecastable. Very different word. You know, we know what the forecast is a day or two ahead of time, but we know it's not very good either. Whereas the tides, I can tell you what the tides are going to be in Admiralty Inlet 100 years from now. And, and you know, I put a lot of money on it, right? Um, that's, that's a well known, absent the turbulent part, you know, what the actual mean flow is going to be. We know that well in advance. So um, in our conversations with Snohomish PD, at least, and, uh, and one person from BPA, that, um, that's a great thing. If you could, just tell me when the, the power's coming, and I'll be able to balance the loads. Just give me a heads up, right? And the, the, the wind problem is the intermittency on short time scales. So, you know, even the forecast might say, you know, hey, you know, Wild is gonna produce you know, 100 megawatts tomorrow, and it turns out to be 130, that's a, that's a problem, right? Um, so this is much more predictable than that. But it is intermittent. It is not what they call base load, right? It doesn't run all the time. They'll run about 70% of the time. That's the projection right now. But it's a small load that you could probably just stick it into base load. Yeah. And yeah, my, my, my totally different question is just, do you, can you do anything? I mean, just things that come to mind are like dragging anchors and fishing nets. I mean, is, is that something you just hope by randomness that it doesn't happen? Or do, you know any way, do you protect your equipment in any way? Or you're just um, we have another version of that platform that, that's called a barnacle that is completely shrouded so that it should not, nothing should catch or anything should sweep over. 
Um, Admiralty, we're, we're lucky enough that it, uh, it doesn't, uh, there's really no one doing fishing there other than, uh, you know, in the back eddy there are people who recreationally fish, but with small, tiny gear, right? Um, so this, in this location we get away with it because no one's dragging there. But other locations, that's a big, big problem. Um, so, and, and in this location we, we go without the shielding because the shielding increases the drag, which would then increase the balance we have to have to put in the place. So, you know, every location is different and every location needs, a, you know, a, a bit of a different customization of the platform. But in other locations, I, we worry a lot about it. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, just a follow up to that is, do you, do you get that instrument on the uh, navigational charts so that mariners are aware that it's there? No, we, we, we do have a, we do have a permit for it, a fill out JARPA, okay. section 10 permit, the Coast Guard knows it's there and everything. But the water is 60 meters deep, yeah. and it is a half meter off the bottom. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and it's about a three meter footprint, right? Oh no, it's less than that. It's only about yeah. a meter by a meter. Yeah. Um, it's the size of your desk, <coughs> that sort of thing. Um, and you know, remember, 60 meters is 200 feet. Um, you know, it's out of range of, of even tech diving, right? I mean, it's, you know, so um, uh, I mean, you know, somebody asked once if I was worried about theft. I said, <laughs> if someone can find that, and locate that, and then actually get it back, could, you know, they can have it. Um, and, and the release codes are, you know, are, are uh, coded. They're, uh, they're 128 bit. I mean, there, there's no way someone's going to come up with that randomly, or even have the equipment to send such a sonar pulse. And so, um, you know, that that part's not a concern. Thanks. You said that you were measuring noise down there and that it's a very noisy place. Would the amount of sonic vibrations have an effect on the other instruments? Um, no, it actually goes the other way around. We hear your pump. We hear, because um, for the conductivity cell to work on, the, on that, that seabird instrument that also does dissolved oxygen, it has to pump the water through at a certain rate, and that pump makes noise. And so in, a, in measuring the ambient, natural noise, we hear that pump, and so now we're duty cycling to, to avoid it um, so that we don't, so that it doesn't contaminate our data, but, so we hear other things, um, but the, the measurement of the sound doesn't contaminate the other ones. Um, those, those pressure waves are, are tiny. I mean, even a, <coughs> even a very loud pressure wave um, is, you know, just milliwatts in actual, in the actual energy flux. Right? Um, it's just that we have very sensitive receivers. Anybody else? Before we go, we need to hand out the...